very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Comrade President Festus, and my younger brother. Uh, let me start with you, uh, and I wish you well. Because, uh, 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 needless to say, that uh, I recognize the presence of the distinguished Senate President, represented by my brother also, distinguished Senator Jalbe, Senate Committee Chairman on Gas. I would like to particularly welcome you to this. Uh, this event, and of course the representative of the Senate Secretary of Government of the Federation. And uh, when they are making the sitting arrangements, I saw a, a gap. They say the first presidents are sitting in rows. There is no space for those who fail elections. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was waiting for the comrade president to say that at least a seat behind someone will be useful, and I'll happily take that seat. Uh, and that person can be no other person than Austin S. N. Wakam because he, dra he pulled me, he recruited me into Pengasa. Uh, <laughs> he was the national president when we were just uh, uh, graduate trainees and he, had, he, he, he influenced def definitely my being an official of the Pengasa from that date. And of course, uh, I don't want to mention all the names. I know everyone, Alajibala uh, Odumi, he was president when we are also seen, have a different view around what Tengasam should do, and he tolerated us for our youthful exuberance at that time. And, and the rest are my peer group, Comrade Brown, Peter Esele, Batunde was one of my supporters that led me to losing the election also. <laughs> But he wasn't part of the loss. <laughs> Actually, he wept after I lost the election. <laughs> and he said, and thank you very much for the comradeship. Uh, otherwise, uh, I'm, I'm one of us, not one of you. And I'm happy to be here. But I also have the privilege of being the group chief executive officer of the NMPC Limited. And let me just take you back a uh, bit in history. Uh, I know Comrade Ostiazem Waka, my elder brother, and my president knows that um, Pengasa people are seen, union people generally, are seen generally as people who have no future in companies because they are not happy with the organization, so they have no prospect. So that's why they are in the union. And I remember in the, in the mid 90s when we had those engagements with the NMPC management staff and they tell us, look, let's just manage these boys, they are not happy. And I remember a uh, few of us said this, that uh, we, we, we were part of these organizations. We, uh, we enjoy the growth in this organization, we'll benefit from it, and that we can be anything in this company. So, and this is a testimony, and I can see very many in the senior Pengasan officials becoming leaders in many organizations. And so it's no longer true. And I'm also one of them. So uh, if but that, that perception is right, you know, I, I shouldn't be standing before you speaking to you as a group CEO of NMPC. So Pengasan people are workers, part of the organization, part of the credible part of the organization that can add value to the organization. And having taken all your time on all this, let me come to the crux of the, of the matter, which is uh, the regulation. What's the vision for deregulation? And how can we have sustainable supply of energy? Maybe my own way of putting it uh, very, very differently. And it's very important to know where we're coming from. Every government has attempted removal of subsidy on, on petroleum products in stages until May 29, every other product that we have in the industry is priced at the market, except PMS. And there are several attempts to do this in the past, historical, 30, 40 years of attempts. But it didn't happen because there was a communication gap. There was lack of facing realities by all of us as a country. By the wrong assumptions that when you take out subsidy, enormous pains will come and that there will be no value or there is no benefit. 
And that was a very, very difficult historical conversation. And I happened to be part of this conversation since I was recruited because I came into the trade unions in a, a few years after being recruited into NMPC. So I know the story of subsidy. And I was relating to it until I became the group CEO of, of this company. If there is one thing that steeple growth in the downstream sector of the petroleum industry is the existence of subsidy. And that's the reality. There are today over close to 25 licenses to create refineries. Build and operate refineries. Nobody could take the next step because as long as you do not have certainty around pricing and who is going to pay for that difference, no one will put his money. And as long as you have arbitrage, it's as simple as also cocaine. Once there is a prince, price differential between one location and the other that is substantial, there is no way you can control fraud of all forms, of all manners. It is impossible. And people will do everything possible to move product between locations, whatever it is, whether it is drugs or petroleum metal spirit. This will happen and people will cut corners as long as the market doesn't determine your price. Now, should market always determine price of commodities? Yes. But should it be managed? I agree completely. And that is what a framework of managing pricing can do for a country. And I also have the privilege of being associated with the Petroleum Industry Act up to its enactment into law. The key issue was that can we deal with the removal of subsidy on PMS? And the law was very clear that with effect from 17th of February 2022, there can be no possibility of having subsidy on PMS. And that the market should determine the price and that the state should take every step that is practical to ensure that you know, the consumer is protected from the, the obvious you know, issues that comes with the open market uh, pricing you know, of petroleum or any product for that matter. So by the 17th of February, there is simply no legal basis, no legal provision to put first to on, on petroleum motor spirit. And of course, uh, we are dealing with a very big country, over 200 million people in population, huge issues around uh, economic inclusion, and therefore it became very obvious that it was not practical to stop the uh, placement of subsidy on PMS. So the National Assembly and government is wisdom decided that can we provide for financing until 30th of June 2023 so that we can now close that gap and then have the right conversation and engagement to ensure that we, are, we, are, we exit this uh, properly. Obviously, budget is one thing, funding is a different thing. And I can tell you, since 2022, when that provision was made, until the 29th of May, not a single Naira was paid to the NMPC Limited as cost of subsidy. That means we are carrying it entirely on the balance sheet of the NMPC. We'll hold back fiscal revenues, taxes, royalties, including profits, and yet, because you are seeing values exceeding 400 billion in a month of subsidy, there is no way even these fiscal obligations will cover for the subsidy. So we are heading towards what is, we can just technically call bankruptcy of the NMPC. Because you will go into negative cash flow. By the end of June 2023, we would have been in negative cash flow. What simply means that NMPC would have been bankrupt if that bold decision was not taken by Mr. President. And of course, uh, there will be a common understanding and argument that oh, there's, a sub there's a provision of uh, a subsidy in the budget. Yes, that's correct but you don't have the resources to back it up. And you're also facing the realities that not doing this will mean the continuous fraud that we all talked about, and I'm very happy the Senate President mentioned it. There's no way you can stop fraud when you have huge arbitrage, so it's not possible. You can exclude yourself, I can say, look, I'm not involved, but that's not sufficient 
because there is simply no way you can manage an environment where there is a huge difference between the market value of a commodity and its price in the market and you continue to have those issues in the market. Shortages, supply issues, cross-border smuggling, round tripping, and you can call anything. They will continue to happen as long as you do not have a market control a pricing mechanism. Government can move its resources so that those benefits that would have been on transportation can go to other sectors, can build railway infrastructure and so on and so forth, so that the ordinary people can benefit better. But as long as you keep this, you will continue to face that challenge and, and this is why all of us must appreciate Mr. President for making that bold step, taking that bold step. But it comes with things, no doubt about it. It brought tremendous challenge to economic realities around us. For instance, cost of transportation almost doubled. As, as you can see, and the reality is also, the evacuation, and I've always said that now we do not have very credible data on fuel consumption in this country. The reason is very, very simple. Technology absence, cross-border smuggling, and all the other segments of our system that are still not optimum cannot allow us to have a total idea or total a fixed number around our consumption. So, but we know the evacuation. Evacuation means every liter of product that leaves the depot is known. So because their trucks are known, the volume they carry, the truck driver, potential destination, fuel station, and so on and so forth. But we all know this. But once they get out of the depot, the next story is anybody's guess. Fuel station will have to sell to jerry cans because we we'll have an energy deficiency gap. You know that, my first, my memo story, everybody knows this, so you have to come with a gallon to buy fuel in the fuel station to fuel your, uh, your, your small generator or any size. Then water pumps for irrigation across the country. So it's not possible to keep accurate data of all this except you're able to have the right installations in all the fuel stations across the country and I know this is work in progress but it's not there today. So we don't have that total visibility. Despite this, the evacuation from the depots declined by 30% since the removal of the subsidy. That means we are doing up to 6.6 .6 million liters of PMS every day and that includes cross-border smuggling, round tripping, and anything that wrong you can call, and also including any other form of uh, uh, irregularity that will happen. You do 6.7 million liters of PM to make sure that there is no scarcity in the country. We knew that that is not our consumption. But as soon as you reduce those volume by just 5 million liters for three days, you'll see queues in the street. That means you have to fill the gap of the realities and also fill the gap of all the things that happen outside the reality. Cross-border smuggling, round tripping and everything. If you don't provide for it, you'll have scarcity. And this is what NMPC has been dealing with for all the years. Knowing fully well that those volumes don't necessarily reflect our real consumption. Now, as soon as the subsidy is removed, that means when you do anything, you, there's no benefit to you if you keep it at home, or in your fuel station, you don't sell, you run into trouble, the banks will come after you. And what we ended up is the market realities, which is why you are seeing 30% drop in, in evacuation from the depot. And this will continue to be so until you have another situation that will make you do something different. For instance, and this is connected to, to the ongoing efforts to ensure that we have alternative fuel. And we all know that CNG as an automobile fuel is very effective, it's cheaper, it's cleaner, and that is why we are putting enormous effort, both as NMPC Limited and as government, to ensure that we scale up access to CNG so that people will have alternative uh, fuel that they can do. And that will bring down the pressure on the PMS. The reason is very simple today, because the way gas is priced, is it doesn't escalate as you see for, for PMS. And therefore, you will probably see if in today's market, I know those who patronize CNG will, will bear me witness that probably 200, 230 naira equivalent per liter. That means instead of 617 in Abuja, you can actually buy fuel of the same value at about a third of the price. 
So this is why those efforts are going on and it will continue to ensure that we, we bring down pressure, we reduce pressure on the, on, the, on, the PM, on the PMS now. Why must you do this? Because first, government must intervene when there's those pains that are very, very obvious that we have seen. Every country does this. Every country has some form of subsidy that is transparent. They call it in different ways. When the tr trouble became enormous during the high prices uh, last year, many Western countries, what they did was they reduced tax rates or they eliminated taxes. You can call it anything, but it will still sum up to subsidy, but it is control, but you still have an even single market for the product and it's still market, market determ determined. And therefore, uh, the regulation of this sector will literally mean to growth in other related sectors, particularly in alternative fuels that we are trying to build, that we are trying to build, build today. And there's no way you can have, we can talk about refining domestically, domestic refining increase, changing the balance so that this country becomes a net exporter of petroleum without resolving the pricing differential. And that is what the regulation has done to our country. It will create more works. And you have, we have already started seeing a number of companies going back to, to their, their construction sites, you know, working on their refinery, refinery, small scale, yes, but people are now have a line of sight that they can sell at market and they can recover their, their, their cost. So as you do this, you, you must be conscious of the efforts that are being made around gas. And today, and I need to share this with you, the globally, financing for oil and gas projects is very, very challenged. A number of issues around climate change that has made banks to be resistant to issuing financing to oil and gas infrastructure. And that's the conversation that is going on of an inclusive and a just energy transition, such a way that uh, countries like us, which are resource dependent, can be protected, we can use the resource of today to build the infrastructure of tomorrow, create the prosperity that everybody needs so that ultimately there will be a just transition and a just response to the climate change issues. And that is why in our country today, we are seeing, and the world has also ad adopted gas as a transition fuel. And that means, you know, we will see funding into, into gas. We are doing it on our cash flow today. Companies are engaging, partners are coming up looking for gas, and of course, uh, as you do this, you know, it is also part of the benefits of the regulation. And that is why people are saying that, look, I can create gas, it can be a little more expensive than what it is today, but I can make money from it. Otherwise, when people see cheap PMS, there is no way you can even have growth in the, in the gas sector. They are all connected. And therefore, for our country, what we need today is to readjust our realities. And what are those realities? Transportation must, must be shifted towards other energy sources, particularly for mass transportation. That means you know, we, are, we must do everything possible to bring to reality the current uh, progress that is being made on CNG buses across the country and also converting uh, vehicles to, to CNG driven. And this is an enormous enterprise. It is ongoing, it is hugely supported by government and we are seeing line of sight and this will crystallize. So as you resolve this, you also know that we are a resource-dependent country. Today, we export 100% of our production. No resource-dependent country does this. And that is why, yes, we must deliver on our mandate. I don't want to speak about it. When it is done, you'll see it. So I don't want to tell you we are going to rebump our refinery. That is uh, too much of PowerPoint talk. So it will be done, and you'll see it. So I don't want to speak about it so that we are, we are tired of speaking about it. But what we must achieve is that this country must be a next exporter of petroleum product. And this is within sight. I strongly believe, now without giving you debt so that you don't, people don't get angry again, that in 2024, this country will become a net exporter of petroleum product. The meaning of this is that you will have sufficient volumes in country and that you will have a delta that can leave our country. And that is where value is great. What does value is great? And I need to also create one very, very uh, erroneous impression always. When you refine locally, yes, you do have advantages creating wealth, creating uh, PRCN, uh, taxes, and all forms of value, creating employment, and so on and so forth. 
But when it comes to pricing of the petroleum product itself, it is the international market that prices it. So you can't price it in your local, you have to move on, Dr. Okon, I'm sure he's going to speak about it. You cannot price it in your local currency and then convert it into international. It's the other way around. Until we, something is done, about, I know there are a number of global conversations going on about pricing everything in your local currency. Yes, I agree, but we're not there today. That means that the pricing of petroleum motors or any other product is a conversion of that value in the international markets versus what you, what you sell in, in, your, in your country. And today, for every refinery, 70% of your operating cost is a cost of pistol. That means you are pricing 70% of your input in the international, that you have no control over 70% of the price of the PMA you see in any fuel station in any country today. That means it's the optimization of the 30% of the input, personnel cost, shipping, and so on and so forth. Even shipping itself is determined by the international market. So at the end, you are probably controlling only 10 to 15% of the cost of PMS in country. So it doesn't necessarily mean that when you have total in-country refining, the price of petroleum product will come down to half. It is not possible, it is not practical. I've seen a lot of offensive uh, media you know, conversations that once you do start refining today, instead of 600, you will sell at 200. I'm sure many of you have come across it, but that's not practical. It is not reality, but to surely have an impact on the pricing of petroleum product in country, more than anything, it guarantees you energy security. That's the most important thing every country looks for that. When I need this product, I will get it. Today, if you have any dislocation of supply, it takes minimum of 14 days for product to come from, from Europe into our country. The closest location, probably 12 days. That's the closest we have. So once you have disruption for any reason, for three to four days, you will surely see the impact of that in the supply chain and you will see queues coming up. That's what we manage. Our endurance today is very weak. Maybe three days endurance. That anything that happens that has impact more than three days, you will see it in the fuel station. For instance, what you are seeing, uh, pockets of it, they are going away. And what caused it? A few marketers decided, because remember, this, that's what the market does. You know, you go to the bank and collect three billion dollar naira, for instance, to buy product from NNPC, and the sales are very slow. So the cost of keeping that product in your, in your tank means that, you know, as long as the value you get does not exceed the bank lending rate, then you'll be losing money. So it's better for you to sell down by two, three naira so that you can actually settle the bank and then your loss is now minimized. So marketing companies started competing against you, bringing down prices. And then people start jumping to the fuel station that has brought down by three naira and so on. And before you know it, you have an issue. And secondly, you have the issue of transportation. The cost of AGO goes up because it is, uh, it is oil marketing companies are, are bringing it to the country. We are the only difference because we are the only can company importing PMS into the country. None of them can do it today. That means that we can manage the market situation without creating any subsidy environment. But for them, access to foreign exchange is different. We have access to exchange. We, we create FX. Therefore, we have access to FX. And their access to FX is limited. And that means that, you know, they have to put any price hedge for the future so that they don't lose money tomorrow. They can go back to the market in two months, three months' time. And that's why you are seeing the 900 Naira edge of pricing which is an add-on to the cost of PMS, if you do. Because once that price keeps going up, the transporting companies or the transporters will not be able to meet those uh, requirements, and therefore they will jack up the cost of, uh, cost of the transportation, and it will have impact on PMS, uh, definitely. So once you have that impact, companies say, look, show me where I'm going to get back this money. If I can't adjust the price, and I can't do it because NFC is not adjusting. You know, you, you must have seen this conversation. And we're attending to this, and, and, and I don't, we don't see any challenge doing this. But this is what the market, we're happy market is adjusting itself. Uh, market adjustment is what we're seeing today, and it is very good for our country so that the market forces take control. But while government does its own role of making sure that palliatives are made available, many things are going on, and I'm happy Comrade President is here and is aware of what is going on. Today. Overall, for our country, we must be next exporter of petroleum product in 2024. And this needs everybody's support. First of all, we, must, we have to focus on gas as a transportation fuel. 
This is very practical. Already significant activities are going on. Government is putting money into East. NMPC is investing with partners. And we believe that in 2024, that revolution will become very, very manifest and people will have access to quick and uh, cleaner and cheaper fuel in 2024 as we, as we go on. It's already happening. A number of buses are combined. A number of state governments have bought buses that are running on CNG. We are carrying out significant projects that will bring CNG into the market with our partners. And we believe that this will work for, for our country. And of course, as you do this, energy is everything. You know, the only sustainable source of energy that we can have today, in our context today, is to build our gas resources. And that is why we are focused as a company, both as a business and also the distinguished senator is here, the law said that energy, NMPC must guarantee energy security for the country. So not doing it is a, it's a, uh, it's a breach of the law. And therefore we are focused on delivering the necessary infrastructure that will deliver gas into the domestic market. And we are almost done. I don't want to put this also. So once there is what is called the OB3 river crossing, that's a 48 five inch five line, that once it crosses the river Niger, we, are, we have a clear line of sight. I don't also want to give you debt. But once it is done, this will be the gas revolution for our country. It will enable delivery of gas from the eastern corridors to the western corridors, link of the AKK pipeline, and also the bottleneck supply to the east. And without doing this, you can't do anything, and we're almost done. Once that is done, people will have access to gas closest to them, CNG, compressor stations close to you, and, and ultimately you will see that spark of uh, gas revolution happening in our country, creating new gas-based industries, creating new empl employment, and perhaps uh, also making people have access to the cheaper well, even for their domestic uh, uh, cooking uh, needs. And, and this is the revolution this country is going through. This is the vision of the president. And it is deliverable. In 2024, I'm sure that you will see those massive changes that will, will naturally happen. And uh, overall, and what does this mean to Nigerian people? I think this is what's important. You're creating prosperity. Once you create pro prosperity, it's for everybody. Yes, I'm comrade, I understand. It's a prosperity for us. Yes, I agree. But you must also remember that we must create prosperity for everybody. And gas revolution will create that prosperity for everybody, which includes all of us in Pengasan and the and overall labor, labor uh, centers in, in, the, in the country. And, and this is good for our country. And as we do this, uh, understanding engagements are very necessary. I know the number of engagements that are taking place between labor and government to ensure that we all understand where we are going. We all need to collaborate and cooperate. And so that ultimately the workers will benefit. They share no pains. We all share the pains, but we don't leave the burden on one, only one set of people. And this is work in progress. This is what a vision of a, of a sustainable energy environment will create. And what it will do ultimately, it will create prosperity. And of course, uh, all the talks around climate change, we all agree our business contributes to climate issues, no doubt about it. And we are not competing with the rest of the world. The whole of Sub Saharan Africa, or Africa itself, contributes only 3% of the greenhouse gases. We understand this. We are not doing a catch up. But today, we do need a just transition. We need to have sustainable energy that is anchored on the resources that is available to us today, which is the huge gas resources we have, as well that we have the replacement fuel for biomass. And ultimately, yes, we can go to the solar, but today you have a resource that you can easily use. And we're also building the solar. We're not abandoning it, but the reality is that we have resources that is available to us that we can use. And this will be the great vision for our country. Thank you very much. Please, can we clap for the comrades of the group, CEO NMPC Limited, Mele Thank you very much.